Romans chapter 1. We've gotten through the introduction. Verses 1 through 7. Let's drop down to verse 8. I'd like to read from verse 8 to verse 12. Now, as I read it, you'll see that this is Paul praying for the people living in Rome, the Christians in Rome. And this whole section really is his prayer for them. And I think... Uh, a prayer for us. Let me turn your attention to Romans chapter 1, verse 8. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin in verse 8. <clears throat> Paul writes, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I might impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, verse 12, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged, by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Join me as we pray. <clears throat> Father, I do ask that today you are honored. Thank you for the songs of faith that teach us the gospel. It is good to be with other believers on the Lord's day to sing. Father, I pray that by your grace you would open us up to hear for so many men and women that feel like they're just sort of just hanging on. For families that have been worn thin. Father, I pray that the gospel would speak and minister and heal. Draw us together. And so be honored this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Book of Romans. Romans is a gospel-saturated letter. Romans is written by the Apostle Paul, and it's written to a group of very brave Christians living in Rome. Now, he didn't really know these people, except when you get to the end of the book, if you flip over and get to chapter 16, there he names about 30 people, so he knew at least some of them in Rome. But it didn't really know the entire church. This church was situated in a city that at the time was the world power. But because they were followers of Jesus, the people living in Rome that were Christians didn't really fit in with the rest of the world. The pressures, the pressures of being a Christian are nothing new. The pressure of raising your kids in an environment that's filled with temptation and danger. Look, that's how it's always been for us Christians. Being ostracized, being misunderstood, being thought odd. If you're, if you're going to love Christ and if you're going to believe what this book says, it is unavoidable. Paul knew that. Paul knew that being a Christian in Rome, like, like being a Christian here, being a Christian in Rome or being a Christian here, well, it can be draining. And this little letter, 16 chapters, the book of Romans, this little letter is written to help people. It's here to be a ministry to us. It is here to unify. It's here to minister to our souls. This little book, the book of Romans, is not meant to be looked at and studied academically and debated. It's not here to cause arguments. This book is here to draw us together to the gospel. This book is here to minister to our hearts so, so that we can better, be better husbands and, and better wives and better children. So you can be more of a leader 
If you're a student, this is here to help you walk through the hallways following Jesus and being able to, to maintain your gospel witness. Because you can look around us whether you do it locally or you do it nationally. Politics is broken. Politics is broken. That's why you won't ever hear me talk about politics. I talk about the Bible. Let the newspaper talk about politics. Why? Because the world is drunk on pornography and materialism and video games. And when you breathe all of that in, and you can't help it, when you, you can't help it, when you breathe all of that in, what happens is it starts, uh, to, it starts to affect you like carbon monoxide poison. Carbon monoxide poison. When you breathe all of that in, it's like carbon monoxide, and you uh, get a drowsiness that's unto death. So many, so many families are breathing the air and it's killing them. And this little book, Romans, it's, it's like a blast of oxygen into our lungs so, so that we can breathe deep and, and, and live clean. As Paul goes from verse 7 now, as Paul goes from the introduction of the letter... Uh, and jumps into this prayer, he jumps into showing us how to center our lives on Jesus. And by example, that's what you find in, in verse 8, by example, he shows us how to pray. God knows we need a lesson in praying. You need a lesson in praying for that child that is a wayward child. For a friend that's dying, we have members of this church right now that are in the hospital praying for somebody they love. We need a lesson in that. We need a lesson in being able to pray diligently and forthrightly for, for the neighbors that are close by that you know are lost or maybe struggling and need you to intervene with gospel ministry. Look, we shouldn't pass this new development going on up here, right here in our front yard, without praying God. Give us those people in, in the name of Jesus. Or, or you personally, honestly. So many people walk into church on a Sunday morning. So many people, maybe it's you, have been wounded by the week and you just sort of barely hang it on and you come to church to have gospel encouragement. Verses 8 through 12 in chapter 1, it's written here for us to learn. Here's what I hope we'll learn today. That when you love the gospel, you learn to pray. When you love the gospel, you learn to pray. In fact, let's take that phrase and use it for all of our points. Here's the first one, number one. When you love the gospel, you make praying a priority. Praying a priority. Notice how he starts. You'll see it right there in verse 8. He starts out and He's finished his section, this in introduction, and now he's into the body. And look what he says, verse 8. First, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Now, he starts with that word first. Oftentimes, if somebody starts with first, you know that there is a second coming. They're going to say first, second, third. Don't you like somebody to number things out for you? Paul says first, but you keep looking for a second all through uh, Romans. You'll never find a second. Paul begins with the word first, not because he has a second, but because he's saying, look, this is the very most important thing that I can do. The best thing I can do for you, Church of Rome, is to take your life and your struggle, take it to God the Father in prayer. Look, prayer can't be a last resort. It has to be the first response. Prayer here is modeled by Paul. It's pictured in Jesus, the great preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was one time asked, what is the key to the success of your ministry? Charles Spurgeon said, my people pray for me. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, hectic schedules and electric screens and social media have distracted us right out of praying. 
couple of things that are plaguing our society, especially, especially our young men and women. They're related together. Anxiety, depression, and worry. Anxiety, depression, and worry, and maybe even self-confidence. I, I don't know why I hear that more and more. And oftentimes, we, let's, not dismiss this, let's not dismiss it now, anxiety and depression are very real things. Oftentimes are medical. You should seek. Common grace has given us psychiatrists and good doctors that can help us through things. But I think part of the answer, maybe not all of it, but part of the answer is a renewed, quiet commitment to centering yourself in trusting the grace of God. We find out when we pray... Look, if, and if, if you struggle with, if you sit here today, struggle with anxiety and depression, don't stop seeking medical help. That's not what I'm saying to you. But I am saying as you're doing that, you put this to the Lord in prayer. One of the greatest missionaries that the United States ever produced was a young man named David Brainerd. David Brainerd was a missionary to the American Indians, American Indians and uh, died of tuberculosis when he was 29 Fell in love with Jonathan Edwards' daughter. Her name was Jerusha. Ended up dying in Jonathan Edwards' house, and Jerusha took care of him. Then she caught tuberculosis, and she died. As he was dying, ministering to the Indians before he was incapacitated, he wrote something, wrote his journal. It's called The Life and Diary of David Brainerd. You should get that. Life, we, don't, we don't have it available yet, maybe in two weeks. Life and Diary of David Brainerd, you, you will not hardly be able to read it. Some people will read it and think, this is the worst thing I've ever read. Some will read it and think, this is so inspiring to me. Because what we have here is his written down prayers and thoughts as he suffered as a gospel-saturated man. Life and Diary of David Brainerd. Read it and learn to pour out, learn to pour out your soul. In prayer. You know, Paul is writing to the church at Rome right here in the book of Romans. You flip over to Philippians. Philippians is written by Paul as he's rotten in a Roman jail. So he gets to Rome and he writes back to the church at Philippi. Remember what he wrote while he's sitting in that prison cell? Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Look, when you love the gospel, when you love the gospel, you make praying the priority. Let me give you another thing to consider with uh, this passage. Number two, when you love the gospel, you learn to be thankful. You learn to be thankful. You love the gospel, you learn to be thankful. If you are not a grateful person, then you probably don't love the gospel. Because to be thankful, you realize that someone did something for you, and the gospel is the greatest thing anybody ever did for anybody. And if you've experienced that, your heart now has changed into a heart of gratitude. You'll see it right there in verse 1. I mean, in verse 8, notice what it says. First, verse 8, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Notice the parts of this prayer. First thing you'll notice is the thanksgiving or the gratitude. It's what grace does to you. Matthew Henry, Matthew Henry said that it's, it's good to begin everything every day with thanking God. And keep looking at verse 8. When you, can, when you can personalize it like Paul did here, I thank God. My God, when you can personalize your thanksgiving like that, it makes every new mercy in your life more sweet. If you sitting here can say, my God, you're not talking about God as a theological construct, but you're talking to, when you're in Christ, now listen, you're talking to God as a loving father to you. Why? Because Jesus Christ, 
Because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross, because of that, we have been given the spirit of adoption by which we can cry out, Abba, Father. Gratitude. Notice something else about that prayer in verse 8. Notice that the prayer is through Jesus. I thank my God through Jesus Christ. Legan Duncan said that, look, there is a theological mouthful right there. Why is that such a theological mouthful? A lot of us, if you still write prayers, I mean, if you still write letters or cards, most of it is an email or a text. My, you know, my mom and dad both have learned how to text, which is a frightening thing <laughs> when grandparents learn how to text. But my mother um, still composes every text as if it were a letter written to me, I'm off at war or something. <laughs> it starts out like this, dear Clint, and then there's the body of the text, and afterwards, miss seeing you, love mom, and signs your name. That's a text right there. A lot of us have forgotten the art of writing a letter. Maybe you do that on email and you'll sign it off as in Christ. And that becomes just a little bit of a tagline at the end of something you've written. I assure you that's not what's going on here. When Paul says, I thank my God and I do it through Jesus Christ. He's saying the same thing that he'll say over and over again. He said in first, remember in first Timothy chapter two, verse five, when Paul tells us there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. Look, our, our prayers, if you're, not a, if you're not a Christian here, if you're not sure where you sit in your relationship to God, let me just say to you that our prayers are only good and they are only heard because of the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Remember when Jesus died, think back to the gospel stories, <clears throat> when Jesus died on the cross and he breathed his last, we find out in Matthew that inside, inside the temple, the veil that separates the Holy of Holies, it split from top to bottom, from God to man, opening up, symbolizing we now have this new access, but you only have that access through Jesus Christ. When we pray to God, knowing Him as my God, when you do that through Jesus, when, you, when you've turned from your sin, and by faith you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, when you believe that, and He's given you the righteousness of Jesus, then, then God is your God. And when you pray, you do so through the mediatorial, write that down and look it up, mediator, someone that is a go-between. You do that through the mediatorial work of Christ. Or here's a more poet, poetic way. I've heard it said that when you pray through Jesus, your prayers visit God the Father sitting on a throne of grace as if they came from the lips of Jesus. You see, when you love the gospel, you, you learn to be thankful to your Father in heaven who purchased you through the blood of Jesus. And this gives us great confidence that, that my God hears me and will answer me. Let me tell you something else about loving the gospel. Here's a third point if you want to write it down. Number three, when you love the gospel, you go quickly to the things of consequence. Here, let me show what I mean now. I, if I can define why I've said you go quickly to the things of consequence, how many of you have sat in a Sunday school room or been in a gathering and, and it comes time for prayer requests and those prayer requests can feel sometimes so trivial. And in, in, in some of your less spiritual moments, you might be thinking, good night, I feel like we have prayed for that cat nine times. <laughs> and let's get on to something else, right? Part of why I don't listen to much Christian radio. I feel like every time, every prayer request is some bizarre. Listen to what Paul is praying is a thing of consequence. Let me show what I mean. You go, with you, uh, go with me to verse 8. Look, look what he says. Look what he's praying about. I thank my God 
through Jesus Christ for all of you. Why? Why is he thinking through Jesus Christ? Because your faith is being proclaimed in all the world. Now, that's probably a hyperbolic statement. He's saying the whole world doesn't know their faith. What he's saying is everywhere I go, I'm hearing about the Christians in Rome. So when you read that, the natural question to me is, well, what is it about their faith that is so well known? Why does the world know about the Christians in Rome? What is it that they're doing? What, what's special about their Christianity over against the Christians in Jerusalem? Well, to answer that question, you've got to think with me. Remember where they are. They're in Rome. And, and Christians in Rome, they lived in the lion's den. Think, think back to history now. Rome is the epicenter of persecution for Christians. In fact, it would be the law of the land to persecute Christians for the next 250 years. Not until the year 310, the Edict of Milan, would it be legal even to be a Christian. And so there they are the, in an embryonic form, the very first church planted in Rome, probably around the year 56, 7, or 8. And if you think about, if you care anything about history, you think about when did they start, look back, wind the clock all the way back to about the year 64 A.D. And there's that wild man Nero. Nero. The emperor Nero. It's probably insane. And the fire of Rome broke out and burned down a whole lot of the city. People started piling on Nero. Nero said, no, it wasn't me. It was the Christians that set the fire. He just blamed the Christians. And because they got hung with setting a fire in Rome, this is the church, probably the same people that he wrote to. It is said that he burnt the Christians at the stake like candles in his garden to provide light as he entertained friends. Why? Because the people in Rome were bending their knee to Jesus, not to Caesar. You see, their faith is being tested and people are dying. And their suffering for the name of Jesus, it became so famous. We still got books about it. They became so well known because they were willing to bend their knee to Jesus and nobody else. In fact, it became famous all over the world, even now. Now, people name their dogs after Nero and worship the Christ that Nero tried to stamp out. You see, when we pray, we go and ask the hard things. I'm not dealing with the trivial. We go to the impossible things. When we, when we pray, we celebrate the faithful things. When we go and ask God to do things, it's a genuine ask. We don't have to equivocate or we don't have to hedge our bets with God. We can put it out there completely. In fact, I'll make that my fourth point. Number four, when you love the gospel, what happens is you trust God with a reckless abandon. I, I think that's what you see in verses 9 and 10. I mean, when you read verse 9 and 10, you... When you read that, you hear the intensity. You see what he says in verse 9 and 10? Let me call your attention to it. Paul writes, for, for God is my witness. Not asking my friend to witness. God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. That without ceasing, I'm always mentioning you in prayer. I'm, I'm, I'm praying for you all the time. Look how serious he is when he says, God is my witness. It's almost like an oath. He says, uh, about God, I serve him with my spirit. That word serve, your Bible might have the word worship. It comes from the Greek word latruo. It uh, has to do with sacred service. He sees his whole life poured out as sacred service as to God. I mean, you'll notice that, that there is this consistency. See it in verse 9 and 10? Without ceasing, I am always praying. And look, all of those are really important things. I mean, I know why it took Donald Barnhouse to go 11 years to go through Romans. 
Because I just want, you just want to go through and just pick out every little thing and point at all of it. And there, there's a lot of that in verse 9 and verse 10 that would be worth doing a study and focusing down on. Including uh, there in verse 9 where he says, um, whom I, God whom I serve in the gospel of his son. There is a statement of the atoning work of Jesus. It's a cross-driven prayer. That reminds us that the cross of Jesus, it, it doesn't just save us. The cross of Jesus makes it so that we have absolute, the absolute covenant right to go to God the Father and draw near to the throne of grace in our time of need. And all of that's important, but there's something else I want you to see here in verse 10. I'm not even going to deal with the spiritual gifts in verse 11 or the mutual giving in verse 12, the fellowship. Those are beautiful passages. Go and do some of the work yourself. It's, it's worth you looking at it. I just want you to see in verse 10. Notice the trust in God's sovereignty and the pleading for an answer. Let me read it to you. Uh, verse 9 and 10. I remember you always in my prayers. I remember you always in my prayers. Asking, listen to the phraseology. Asking that somehow... By God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. But, I mean, you have this aggressive trusting here. Verse 10, you see that word ask, asking, dinamite, it, it is of this, this petition, it is pleading, it, it, it's, it's seeking, it's almost begging. I don't think we know that posture very well. I think we yawn through our prayers. Notice the phraseology there in verse 10. Somehow, by God's will. I mean, you know, right? Paul wanted to be in Rome. He starts off saying that. You'll hear him say it a bunch of times in the book of Romans. He's begging to be in Rome. But even as he's begging God to give him a pathway to Rome, he is submitting himself to the will of God. Do you see that? That somehow, by God's will... But talking about God's will doesn't stop him from making his request. You know, you sometimes hear people say, well, <clears throat> when, when, when God shuts one door, he opens another. We'll say that sometimes if something doesn't work out and you're saying to somebody, here's some hope for you. God shuts a door, he opens another. Or you might say it like this, well, God shuts one door, he opens a window. So I've heard all of those kind of things before, and I, and I understand the meaning behind that. But here's what I, I don't think we spend enough time banging on shut doors. If it's true that Revelation tells us that if God opens the door, no man can shut it. Well, then it's true that if he shuts the door, no man can open it. Well, then if no man can open it, it's not going to hurt a little bit to stay there and bang on it a while. Bang on that shut door. Because sometimes you didn't hit it hard enough. Sometimes our thoughts of God's sovereignty, and I, look, I believe in God's sovereignty completely. Sometimes our thoughts of God's sovereignty rob us from praying fervently. When, when, when sovereignty is nothing more than submission. Sovereignty is saying, I believe God is in control of all things. I trust that and I give that to you. But here, Lord, I, I want you to do this. A willingness to pray with your entire heart. To, to pour, yourself out, pour yourself out. Don't, don't hedge. You don't have to hedge it if it be your will. Certainly that's what Jesus taught us. But we're trusting God's going to do His will. We leave the outcome to God, but we ask Him to do the impossible. Why do we stand in the hospital room and pray for pe people to get healed? Because we want them. We love them. We want them to, to get healed. doesn't mean we don't trust that if God takes them, that he didn't hear our prayers. We do trust in God's will, but we're asking God to do something. Look, you ought to, this is completely different, by the way, from naming it and claiming it. This is naming it and trusting God. I'm asking you to, to, to walk by your neighbor's house and pray that God will convert that person. Pray for hurting people and, and sick people. Trusting that God's going to do what he's going to do, but we, we ask him if there's any way, by somehow, by God's will. That's what Paul did. It's exactly what Paul did. And then he trusted the outcome to God. For instance, let me illustrate it from Paul's life. Paul prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Beg God, let him go to Rome. 
And when the Lord finally let him go to Rome, remember how he went? He went in chains on a prisoner ship. Now, the lesson might be, be careful what you ask for. I, I think, though, the lesson is God answers our prayers in a way he sees fit. Because when Paul was taken to Rome, sitting there in a Roman prison, rotting in the Roman prison, some think he probably died there because he wanted to get off over to Spain. Sitting there in a Roman prison is where he would write one of the most encouraging, if you're depressed, go read Philippians. One of the most encouraging letters in the Bible. The book of Philippians. In fact, he gives, a little, he gives a little biography in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Remember what he says? Paul writes, I, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, he's writing back to the church of Philippi, what has happened to me, he's in jail, has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all of the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. What, what, a, what a great gospel-saturated approach to life, a life fully submitted. That's what I'm asking you to do today. A life fully submitted to God, encouraging, strengthening the church, Paul's doing it right through his own suffering. Isn't that what the gospel does for us? Isn't that what the, gives us ground to stand on? When I say the gospel, I mean the perfect life, the death of Jesus on the cross for sinners, his resurrection from the dead, and you believing that he died for you. See, Jesus makes us a body. He makes us a family. He makes us a church. And part of being the church is today, together, we strengthen that bond through taking the Lord's Supper. I can't think of any better way to end this time of preaching than for us to celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Would you join me as we pray? And then I'll give us some instructions on the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your grace to us in Jesus. Thank you for the chance to celebrate life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And we pray that you keep us a gospel-saturated church. And be especially honored now as we take the Lord's Supper in Jesus' name. Amen.